Hello, my name is Margaret McFall Nye, and I'm Professor and Director of Pacific Biosciences Research Center, School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, this is my second iBiology talk, and I would like to talk this time about the Squid Vibrio Association, one that my lab works on. And this, uh, what I'm showing here is I'm showing the squid itself uh, with a scale bar down here to show you that the animal is actually quite small. And uh, it's a night active predator in the shallow sand flats of the Hawaiian archipelago here. And um, it's a, an absolutely beautiful animal, but it also is an experimental model for the chronic colonization of epithelial tissues by gram-negative bacteria. And this turns out to be perhaps the most common way in which bacteria live with animal cells. And that is along the apical surfaces or the, uh, or the edges of epithelial cells. So it's, it's um, important for us to learn uh, the general rules behind how these things work. And so that's why we're studying this very simple uh, model system. So I wanted to introduce you to the habitat in which Euprimna lives. So up here uh, we have uh, a lot, this is on Oahu, Hawaii. And then uh, here is Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And in the shallow sand flats just off of HIMB and other places on the island of Oahu, you will find uh, Euprimna scolopes in the shallow waters. So here I am down here collecting Euprimna. And so you just walk along with a light and a dip net. Uh, and Euprimna is a night active predator, so we'll be out of the sand during the day, or during, excuse me, during the evening, and you can collect it at that time. So here I am, I've, I've caught a squid, and I'm reaching down to, to put that squid into my goodie bag and move on uh, to looking for the next squid. So once we get our squid, uh, what we do is we bring them to the Kualo Marine Lab. And this is actually the laboratory in which, um, uh, the, the, the large laboratory situation in which my labs uh, are housed. And in, in this environment, we have a set of seawater tables, running seawater tables. And in those seawater tables, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a series of eggs. So there's a set of eggs, and there's a set of eggs, and there's a set of eggs. If you look at the eggs, uh, what you see is you see here there are clutches that have been laid, in this case, on dead coral rubble uh, by the females. And so what we do is we have a breeding colony and we provide the females with small bits of plastic, and they lay their eggs on that or on coral or dead coral rubble. And we sequester them away into an egg tank. And after about 20 days or so, these eggs will hatch. And what you'll have is you'll have a baby squid. And these babies are very small. They're about the size of a fruit fly, uh, just a couple of millimeters. And we do our experiments. And on any given night, you can have um, hundreds and hundreds of squids hatching. So in your experiments, you can have very, very large numbers uh, for good statistics. So some de details about the symbiotic system. This casual guy up here is an adult Euprimna. If you were to open the body cavity of Euprimna, you would see that it has this um, bilobed light organ in the center of the mantle cavity. Looks like two kidneys together. And if you looked at one of those lobes, what you would see is you would see that in the middle here are a set of crypts. And those crypts are the epithelia that support the culture of the symbiont, which is Vibrio fisheri. And so uh, there are these three crypts. And a light organ, most light organs of animals, are very similar to backwards eyes. And that is to say that they have the, the associated tissues that, that an eye has. They have a lens, they have a reflector, they have an ink sac. The diverticula of the squid's ink sac acts sort of like an iris to allow more or less light of Vibrio fisheri out. Now Vibrio fisheri is, as I'm alluding to, a luminous bacteria. It makes light uh, for the animal. And so what, instead of translocating a nutrient to the animal, which is what our symbionts do for us, what this, this particular bacterium does for its host is the host uses light produced by the bacteria. So this is a, a, a histological section of one of these crypts showing uh, the epithelium that's supporting the Vibrio fisheri. And then down here is a transmission electron micrograph. And you can see that they occur 
uh, in very dense culture along the apical surfaces of epithelia. So what the animal does with the, the uh, light is it does a behavior called counter-illumination. And this is an anti-predatory strategy. And so the animal is a night active predator. It comes out and it matches moonlight and starlight so that it doesn't cast a shadow against a visual field, the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So it's sort of like a Klingon cloaking device or something. It's a camouflage uh, for the animal. And so um, and it, it's able, because the moonlight and the starlight vary, you know, the moon goes behind a cloud or something like that, um, the animal is able to modulate the amount of light that comes out of the light organ. And so it does that with the ink sac. And so under dim light, environmental light conditions, it emits very little light, whereas under bright environmental conditions, it pulls back the diverticula of the ink sac and will emit more luminescence. Why do we like to study this system? Well, we like to study this system because it's a binary symbiosis. That is to say there's one host and one microbial species that's living together with the host. And so I sometimes make this analogy between um, a conversation that two people are having. So if you stand to the side of the conversation that these two people are having, you can learn about very, 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 with high, very high resolution what the conversation is between these two individuals. It's not hard at all. And I compare the, the human gut to something like a political convention crowd. In other words, huge, huge numbers of individuals, different individuals, all saying something different to, to the next person or the next person, and trying to figure out the conversation that's going in, on in there and what it means and, and, and the importance of it is much more difficult. So what we hope to do by studying a very simple association is to provide the rules underlying how um, animals talk to bacteria and how bacteria talk to animals, and then that can be applied back to looking at something more complex like the human microbiota. The other thing that's really important is that form and function of host membranes are highly conserved. That is to say, um, the kinds of membranes that, that um, interface with, my, the, with microbial symbionts are the same across the animal kingdom. And that is because animals have lived with bacteria throughout evolutionary history. And so they, they arrived at some great solutions and they all use them. So what I'm showing up here at the top is a mucociliary uh, membrane, and um, that is very similar in structure and function to the, what, what you're seeing here, which is a microciliary membrane in an invertebrate. What I'm showing over here is I'm showing human tissues um, on this side, and I'm showing uh, invertebrate tissues on this side. And in this case, I'm using the example of the squid that I work on. But you can see that this mucociliary uh, is very, very, this mucociliary tissues are very similar to one another. And likewise, uh, microvillus uh, membranes are very similar. And so the microciliary, mucociliary are mucus and cilia, and the microvillus are extensions out of the host cells. And here you see the microvilli along these green structures, the microvilli, and they interface very closely with the microbes. And this is also true uh, in the squid. These are Vibrio fisheri, and they're associating very, very closely with this uh, ciliated, uh, this, excuse me, this microvillus uh, surface within the crypts, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So what kinds of questions do we want to know the answer to when we study symbiosis? We want to know about establishment. Most symbiotic associations are acquired anew each generation. How in the world do you select the right partners from the random assortment of microbes in the environment. The second question is, how, does, how do the host and symbiont influence one, one another's development? Thirdly, once you get your symbionts, how in the world do you keep them stable? How do you keep the immune system from getting rid of the symbionts? And likewise, how do you keep the symbionts from overgrowing the host? So these are really important questions about, about the trajectory through development of a symbiotic association. So let's start with establishment. Think about that. How does it all start each generation? How do we harvest our symbionts? And how do we know to get the right ones? That is, the specific ones. So how does the squid harvest its symbionts? So interestingly, what we find in these baby squid is that they, uh, the, the symbiosis produces tissues that promote harvesting. So here's the juvenile squid. 
And immediately upon hatching, it begins to ventilate water through its mantle cavity. And that water is, has a, a small amount of embryo fissuri that it can then um, access. So how does it do it? Well, the animal has two ciliated surfaces on either side of the light organ. So here's the ciliated surface here, here, and the ciliated surface here. And so if you look at the base, so each one of the ciliated surfaces has uh, two appendages. Here's an anterior appendage and a posterior appendage. And those appendages actually form a ring in the living animal. And at the base of each appendage is three pores that are indicated by each of these arrows. So on each side of the light organ, there are three pores. And each pore leads to an independent crypt where the, back, where the vibrio fissurae will eventually come to reside. If you were to take a cross section through the light organ at this point, what you would see is you would see the journey that the bacteria had to go through as they make their way into the crypts. So here, down at the bottom here, is one of those pores. Vibrio fissurae goes up into the pore, up this duct, into an antechamber, to a bottleneck, and into a crypt space where it interacts with two cell types, the epithelium and some hemocytes that tell the animal what's going on in the crypt. Now the challenge, there's quite a challenge that the, that the symbiosis has to getting started. What is that challenge? Well, the animal must engage Vibrio fissurae and only Vibrio fissurae. So in the absence of Vibrio fissurae, nothing else gets in this light organ. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing that the bacteria go through a habitat transition. They're free living in the seawater, and they go to living in a very dense culture just all by themselves. So how do horizontally transmitted symbioses make such a transition? Well, if you look at Vibrio fissurae and you look at the numbers, um, in the bacterial plankton, they're only about 0.1%. That is, they're about 1,000 cells against a background of a million other bacterial cells per mil. That's a huge uphill climb for them. And they, they move into pure culture at 10 to the 11 cells per mil in the light organ. How in the world do they do this? Well, let's look at the steps in harvesting. The first step is that this animal, upon hatching, responds to common molecules of all the bacteria in the surrounding seawater. It re responds to cell wall molecules of bacteria by shedding copious amounts of mucus onto the surface of this light organ. And so I've stained the mucus. The, lab the mucus has been labeled here in blue. The, the, the squid tissue is in red. And the cilia on the surface are in green. And actually, it's in a plane such that you can't see most of the cilia, which actually cover that whole surface, uh, the ciliated surfaces. The second thing that happens is Vibrio fissurae aggregates. And so these are labeled Vibrio fissurae cells. They're labeled with uh, a fluorochrome called a red fluorescent protein. And so there's um, a biophysical component to this becoming specific. What they do is they aggregate along these ciliated surfaces. And the activity of the cilia is absolutely essential for catching the right size of microbe. And that is about two microns. But most, most microbes are about two microns. So it only eliminates a few of them in that way. What it does is it also, um, there's a biochemistry to this step um, that is, is really important. The other thing that happens here with the biochemistry is the, the bacteria aggregate. And they don't just land and then go into the crypt and land and go in. They aggregate and they sit there for a while. And what they're doing while they're sitting there is they're being primed for the next steps. And one of the aspects of the next step is to know where to go. And so they're being gathered, and they've got to somehow figure out where to go from from this aggregate. And so what you see in the third step is after they've aggregated and they've become primed for the next steps of going into the light organ is they chemotax into host tissues. And so what you can see is you can see them streaming down in here uh, into a pore, and then they will um, colonize the light organ. What's interesting is that one, it, it turns out that in this 
journey, at the end of the day, only one symbiont gets into each crypt. And that happens at about six hours. And then at 12 hours, the bacterial population fills the three crypts, and they begin to luminesce. And so what I'm showing here is I'm showing the three crypts. And you can see what we've done is we've labeled, uh, we've inoculated a co-culture of RFP, red fluorescent protein labeled Vibrio fisheri, and green fluorescent protein labeled Vibrio fisheri. And you can see how they're segregated in the three crypts on one side of the light organ. So they do completely um, seem to, most of the time, completely segregate, which is amazing because you can put a large number of Vibrio fisheri outside and you can get 100 or so different colors of bacteria going into, uh, the, into the duct. But at the end of the day, uh, only uh, one, of, uh, one bacterium on average will get into the crypt spaces. So why is that? It has a little bit, we think, to do with the biogeography. So what you have here is you have the pore. So uh, this pore here, the bacteria enter this pore. They go down this long duct. They enter this antechamber here that they sort of carry them around. Then they come down to this bottleneck. And that bottleneck is only a couple of microns wide. And it seems to be a gatekeeper. And so what happens is, Vibrio fisheri enters there, and it grows up and then begins to luminesce. So this is the, the, this bright, these bright colors here signify the three crypts luminescing with Vibrio fisheri. You'll notice here that, that there's no luminescence in any other portion from the pores down to the crypt space. And that is because once Vibrio fisheri gets in there, for most of the day, they're restricted to that portion of the light organ. What about development? What we found is that the symbionts, once they get into those crypt spaces, they induce the loss of the tissues that, that uh, were absolutely essential for their recruitment. And so it's as though they go in and shut the door behind them. And so that ciliated surface that you see here that's so complex, it begins to be lost by cell death. So the bacteria are deep inside the tissues and they induce the loss of the superficial epithelium somehow remotely. We actually are not quite sure how that happens. But by five to six days, what you see is th that, that this light organ, this juvenile light organ, no longer has those complex ciliated surfaces on it and is going on to become a mature light organ. So the bacteria are essential for inducing development. How do they do it? The symbionts induce development using very common molecules of microbes. And that, we call these microbe-associated molecular patterns. All gram-negative bacteria, almost all gram-negative bacteria, have a surface molecule in their surface membrane called lipopolysaccharide. And almost all bacteria have a cell wall made of something called peptidoglycan. It turns out that this animal uses these, what we call MAPs, microbe-associated molecular patterns, as a way to trigger development. What's really interesting about this is lipopolysaccharide's other name is endotoxin. So it's the thing that causes endotoxic shock. And we're finding out that the presence of lipopolysaccharide, for instance, in your gut is really essential for gut homeostasis. It's all about presenting that molecule in the right context. In this case, it induces development. And peptidoglycan um, is also, its subunits are also considered toxins in the wrong context. But these molecules are really, really common. So the specificity of the developmental induction by Vibrio fisheri has to do with the fact that only Vibrio fisheri can get into those crypt spaces and present these really common molecules at a, at a high enough concentration that the animal can respond with development. So what we found, we found this um, some time ago, and um, that published a paper in 2004 um, in, in uh, talking about MAMPS-induced developmental induction. About four years later, uh, a, a researcher at the Pasteur Institute, Girardi Barrel, said, you know what? We've always known that the gut of mammals is induced to undergo development by exposure to gram-negative bacteria, but we've never known how and why. And he thought to himself, if a squid can do it, 
um, so can a mouse. And so um, he uh, tried the same experiment that we tried. And indeed, these are conserved responses over evolutionary time. So I didn't find that at all surprising. But it's, it's amazing how um, uh, animals, I mean, why use something different? Just use the same toolkit. So finally, let's uh, spend a few minutes on stability. This particular animal, as I mentioned, is a night active predator. So at night, it's out swimming in the water column, and during the day, it buries in the sand. And when it buries in the sand, it's quiescent. And it doesn't need the symbionts at this point because it uses them as, an anti, as a camouflaging strategy at night. So what happens at dawn is that this animal vents 95% of its symbionts into the surrounding seawater. So what you see here is you see what looks like a, you know, toothpaste coming out of the side of the, the light organ. There's one pore in the adult on each side, and each day at dawn, they vent 95% of their symbionts into the surrounding seawater. The 5% remaining inside grow up during the day and fill the light organ so that when the animal comes out to forage at night, it has a full complement of Vibrio fisheri. But these, this, this is something that the animal does every day, and it's part of its dial rhythm, and it keeps the symbiosis in check. So what we see is we see this daily rhythm on symbiont density. So when the animal buries, it vents 95% uh, into the surrounding seawater. Then they grow up, and they grow up actually by just around noon. And then they're stable throughout the night when the animal needs them. And then when the animal buries in the sand, it vents them again. And so this is on this beginning, the very first day after hatching, the animal begins to do this behavior. So underlying this is a really profound uh, dial rhythm on the transcriptome and on the ultrastructure of the, the um, host cells. So what you see here is that just before dawn, um, there's a huge change in gene expression in the host. And it, the host is in blue here. The symbionts are in green. You see in the symbionts, you see up and down um, varies over the day-night cycle, but there are just about as many genes up as there are down. In the host, it's a little bit different. What you see is you see a huge number of genes upregulated just before dawn, and the same, very same genes downregulated just after dawn. So this told us that there was something likely very interesting happening at the level of the cells, and we indeed saw that. So when you looked at the ultrastructure at these two different times of day, just before dawn, or um, excuse me, um, uh, most of the day, what you see is you see the, the symbiosis looking more or less like this, very healthy. This is what your, your gut looks like. Um, and then uh, with, with the microvilli, very nicely organized, and so on and so forth. Just before dawn, what you see is you see the effacement of the microvilli. The cells are shaved of all their microvilli, and the, the microorganisms, Vibrio fisheri, is vented out with, with much of that. So it goes from sort of a beneficial stage to a pathogenic stage, to a beneficial stage, to a pathogenic stage. Now what's happening here in this huge change in gene expression is that all of the genes associated with the host cytoskeleton are being upregulated in preparation for this huge remodeling. And so just after dawn, they're downregulated. And so the animal, this has the, the earmarks of a circadian rhythm because this is prescient before dawn and it, and it um, so that they anticipate dawn. So this is a very profound rhythm uh, at the level of transcriptome and, and ultrastructure. The other interesting thing we found is that the peripheral clock, in other words, the clock of the light organ, is run by the symbionts. Symbionts are required for this circadian rhythm. So if you, in an aposymbiotic or non-symbiotic animal, you don't see these rhythms. And the rhythms are driven by the symbionts. They regulate what is called clock genes that are essential for the setting of circadian rhythms. And so this particular, these particular clock genes um, are very, very interesting. The one we looked at was something called cry. And in this animal, there's one cry in the head that is responsive to the circadian rhythm of day-night cycles of the environment, 
and there's one in the light organ. And that's um, responsive to the day-night cycles of luminescence, which are about 12 hours off of the environmental light. But the other thing that we could show is by using genetics of the bacteria is that a dark mutant of Vibrio fischeri is not capable of setting the circadian rhythms. So it, the setting of the circadian rhythms does require the light produced by Vibrio fischeri. So, and then it was found, just like with NAMPS, that uh, we were the first people to find that circadian rhythms of, of an animal can be and are driven by its bacterial symbionts. And recently in mammals, it's been shown that daily rhythms um, are, uh, are also occur uh, in, in mammals. And they are very likely, they're almost certainly set uh, by the microbiota. So then in conclusion, model systems, I hope I've convinced you that model systems provide insight into mechanisms underlying symbiosis. Specificity of symbioses can involve both biomechanical and biochemical factors. Symbionts drive tissue maturation, and daily rhythms of symbiosis seem to create the stability that we see in the symbioses. And I can't um, finish a talk um, on this topic without uh, expressing my great appreciation to all of my, the students and postdocs with whom I've worked, and the opportunity to work on the squid vibrio system. So what I'm showing here is I'm showing uh, a, uh, party at the 25th anniversary of the study of the squid vibrio system. And here is my partner, Ned Ruby, with whom I've worked on the squid vibrio system uh, for these last 25 years. And I'd also like to express my appreciation um, to all the funding agencies who have so generously funded uh, the research over the years. Uh, in addition, um, I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with many, many labs um, since 1989 when we started the study. Um, and in addition to Ned, uh, Pete Greenberg at University of Washington has been an incredible uh, supporter of, of our work. And Mike Apicella and Bill Goldman have been the people who worked on MAMPS with me for all these years. And I've made, uh, there's a list here of all the labs. There are something like 30, uh, 33 investigators from 23 labs from several countries. So I really appreciate uh, their being willing to work with me on this really uh, uh, interesting adventure. So thank you. <laughs>